Good morning, church family. It's time now for our garden of prayer. And I have two lists this morning. Names uh, that have requested a special remembrance and prayer this morning. The first is uh, Shay Bennett. We have uh, Michael Jeffries. The People in Ukraine, Wanda Thomas, Tori Ellis, The Sheets Family. I want to remember Lucky Laycock and uh, Tanya Ashley and Bruce Her Herbert. Um, most of you know that Bruce was in an accident and he has a series of surgeries that he's going to need to go through. And if you would like to make contact with him, send him a, a note. Scott has his address, uh, his nephew. Scott is his nephew and uh, has his address if you would like to send him a card. I want to, uh, I know that many of you will think that this is the only text that I know but I think it is, it's extremely important to be reminded of why we are here this morning, and it's Psalms 100. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. I want to invite you uh, to come forward to our garden of prayer if you would like. If you choose to stay where you are, I invite you to kneel as we seek the Lord in prayer. Please join us in singing. Sweet.
Father in heaven, it is with grateful hearts that we come into your presence here this morning. Lord, to sing praises unto you, because you are our creator and redeemer. You're the author of life, the sustainer of life, Lord. And we come into your house to worship you, Lord. And we just, we thank you for that privilege. Lord, we pray that you would be with us in a special way this morning, that you would pour out your spirit upon us. Fill us, Lord, with your love, that we might be a witness to all that we come in contact with, Lord. For we know that there are many that are seeking to know you. Use us, Lord, as an instrument of your love. Lord, I pray that you would be with our speaker this morning, that you would just guide and direct his words, that your name will be glorified. Lord, I lift up the names of those that we have read this morning. You know each one. You know each need, whether that is a physical need or a financial need. Lord, I just ask that you would touch each one, but most importantly, Lord, I pray that you would use us as your hands and feet and mouthpiece that we might reach out to those in need. And Lord, I just I want to thank you once again. I pray that you would bless us with your presence in Jesus' holy name. people out there than just folk. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. I need to know you're engaged. We're here to worship and praise the Lord, right? That's right. You're supposed to be part of this process, not just us. Um, How many of y'all grew up with a song you remember your mom or dad always uh, singing, or in my case, uncle, um, when you were growing up? Do you have that in your memory? You know, there's one or two, or there's several for us because Philip plays piano all the time. And mom would always sing, especially when she was washing the dishes. And I would sometimes be back in my bed and I'd be laying there and hear Uncle Philip playing the piano and my mom singing. And there's one song she loved to sing, and we're going to sing it this morning. There's something about that name.
to when we've had our heartaches.
Happy Sabbath. One of the nicest things about being here on Sabbath that I enjoy is that when we get to come together and join in our praise of God, we want to take a moment like we would with anyone that we dearly love, that we want to spend time with. We want to express gratitude for those things that have been done for us, ways throughout our lives, throughout our weekly and daily lives that have been done for us that it is so easy to pass over without recognizing it when we take a little time to contemplate the gifts that he has given to us. It can give us such a great appreciation. And with it's not out of a sense of, this is my friend, I love my, you know, they, I, they've done something nice for me, I have to do it. It is, there is, there is a love and a fulfillment that comes when we recognize he has given all that we have. Everything we have, we are borrowing from him. And it gives you, when you give something to your loved one, your daughter, your husband, your relative, your friend, and you see the joy that that brings, it gives, warms your heart for the chance to express a fraction of what you feel. We have the same opportunity, even when things look more challenging than we think, because we tend to put our faith in the things that we can touch, things we can see that we have. There's our surety. That's not the case. We have been, we have been advised through scripture that our surety comes from the source of wealth that, that he's given to us to enjoy. What a chance to go out in faith and to return to him a portion, a chance to take some joy in allowing us to participate in this wonderful process of worship. Uh, the, the budget for today, the offering for today will be for church budget. We thank you so much. Sorry. The other thing, I did want to take a moment and if we could bow our heads in prayer for just a little bit. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful to you for the chance to come to you to show our appreciation, our love for the love that you have given us in a small way to, to express to you that our gratitude. And we thank you so much for the opportunity to grow our faith and to see the ways in which you will use this for your work. In your name we pray and we thank you.
time now for our children's story, and we want to invite our children to go to the back, pick up a basket, and come forward, collect the lamb's offering that goes for our Pathfinders and Adventures Club. And we have a special treat for you this morning. We have three of our TCA students that are going to share a story with you. Good morning, boys and girls. Happy Sabbath. I hope you guys are having a good morning today. My name is Layla. My name is Quinn. And my name is Alex. We are from Tri-City Christian Academy, and we are in the seventh grade. I hope you guys are had a great week and that you're looking forward for your story today. In today's story, we are going to look at James 3, verse 3. It says, when you put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn a whole animal. In these verses, it says we can make big things go wherever we want them to go. So what these verses are saying, it, so what these verses are saying is that when we speak, there's power in those words. So whatever we do, we want to build each other up. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, it tells us to build each other up for the honor and glory of God. Since we are human, and you know we get a little angry and we get a little frustrated and we say hurtful things to other people and God doesn't want that for us. So in order to illustrate that, Layla has this piece of paper right here. So say it's your friend's day or your parent's day. You know, when you say something mean and don't really think about what you're saying, you could say something really hurtful. So let's say that Layla said something mean about Quinn and keeps saying all those mean things about her. Even though if Layla, Layla were to say sorry, she realized what she did was wrong and that there was no going back. So now you see here, this paper is pretty crumpled up and no matter how hard you try to, to get it back to the way it was before, all nice and smooth, so, boys and girls, I challenge you before you say something mean to ask God to give you the Holy Spirit so that your words will build each other up and not tear each other down. All right, let's pray. Would anybody like to pray for us? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this day. Please let us have a good day. And please let my cat come back in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. You can now go back to your seats.
morning and a happy Sabbath, church family. Today's scripture reading is found in 1 Corinthians 10.31. Therefore, wherever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God.
It is my privilege to introduce our speaker this morning, Walt Cross. Uh, for many of you, uh, you don't need an introduction. Some of you may remember that Walt was a, a member here at Kernersville, he and his wife, Mary Lou, and uh, was a leader. Some of you know Walt uh, as a speaker on uh, Amazing Discoveries, or that he is the uh, speaker director of International uh, Lifestyle Center. So, Walt, we just want to welcome you back to, to Kernersville. We hope that uh, the Lord will bless you as you are with us here today. I want to tell you ahead of time that there will be a love offering collected at the end of the service to help defer expenses, travel expenses for Walt and his wife. Thank you. Good morning, y'all. Good morning. Well, I must say that I've never said this before to a church I go to, and I go to a lot of places, but it's plum good to be here. You know, I was sitting here, and I was thinking as I was sitting there, do you realize, Mary Lou, it was 30 years ago this weekend that we first come here? 30 years ago. That was the first weekend in February. And as we walked in... The music caught Mary Lou's ear, and we sat down, and we were sitting right about where Danny is, and, um, and actually, she said, I can't see who's playing the piano, but that's Danny playing the piano, and uh, she, had, she knew his, his, his style back from SMC, and the preacher that day was a preacher y'all had that was, didn't stay long. He left shortly after we came here. And he said something that I'd never heard before. He, he, he said, now, if I say anything that you can't find in the Bible, leave. Don't listen to me. And I thought that was quite interesting. This church is not a normal church, I tell you. Um, you know, it was good to be in Sabbath school this morning and, and see that foundation still here. Um, a church called me. This week, a physician who's who's the uh, who's the uh, head elder at his church, and they're having some challenges going on right now. And I shared with him counsel that y'all taught me here. And I asked back in the back if it's tr still true, and yes, it's still a procedure here. And let me tell you something that happened behind closed doors in an elders meeting. I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but let me tell y'all something. It was in this church. <clears throat> we were looking for a, a new associate pastor. Do you remember that? And um, we went to a local restaurant, and the conference president came up. And he says, I've got the man for you. Now, he's my man, and you leave him alone. He says, I don't care what music he plays. I don't care what he does, where he takes the kids. He's my man. Just leave him alone, and I will give you an associate pastor youth pastor. Do y'all remember that? And do you remember what all of us voted for unanimously? Take his youth pastor back to Charlotte. <laughs> That's the kind of church y'all have here. And y'all are blessed. You really are. This morning, I'd like to share with y'all something that's dear to my heart. Um, how many y'all believe that Jesus is coming soon? You believe so? I believe so. And I believe in something called preparing. And as y'all remember, I was part of the fire department, uh, something I started at SMC and I continue today. And I was on the um, Randleman Fire Department when we lived down in Randleman. And um, we find in the fire service that preparation is very important. And I go into the school system each year and I teach the kids, do you know, now, Dan and I were SMC back, you know, 40-something years ago. Uh, and actually, it's been 
40 years ago tomorrow that Mary Lou and I started dating down at SMC. But I joined the fire service and <clears throat> 42 years ago. And today we have much less structure fires than we did when I started. And the United States Fire Administration says that is because of two major things. One is we have better wiring codes today. But number two is this right here, where we go in the school system and we teach the kids about fire prevention. And as we go in there and we teach them year after year after year, and as children grow up and they become moms and dads and have their own homes, those practices are put into place and we see less structure fires. We go and we teach the kids about stop, drop, and roll. We teach, uh, we have our firefighters come in and we show them that we're not Darth Vader coming in and not to run in the closet, not to run under the bed, to come to us when their house is on fire. We have a little fun and we go in and teach and actually that firefighter right there in the black is Carson. Carson was born when we lived here. Carson turns 30 this coming July. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Um, he was born while we were going to church here. Um, this is a car wreck that I came upon, and actually I saw this wreck. Uh, what would happen if the firefighters who got off that fire truck said, hmm, and that door, the driver's door, we actually it had to be pried open. And what if the guys had not prepared? What if they had never learned about how to use Jaws of Life, and they got off the truck, and when one guy says, you get Jaws, and I'll read the manual. Is that a good idea? We, that door had to be pried open, and we had to fly that guy out. <clears throat> I apologize, I was late this morning coming because I was following through on preparation. Last night we had a significant wreck, two, uh, two cars wrecked at home, uh, head on, all three occupants in combination of both vehicles were killed. And um, so this morning I was applying the process of getting our guys help. Especially the more, one, one fatality, our guys do pretty well, but when we get into two, three, especially three fatalities or more, our guys start having some, some challenges working through that. And so this morning while I was at the hotel, I was working on getting that team to go in and take care of those guys. It was two fire departments that were involved. Those guys need help today. Preparation. You know, if they, this, we say, well, in a couple of days, in the, and the guys were having problems, and, and we say, well, maybe we need to help those guys. No, let's jump on it. Let's nip it in the bud. And so that was happening this morning. This is a situation where we had, um, we had a family that came in. Thank you. We had a family that came in from uh, North Carolina over to Waterville, which is the very first exit, getting off I-40 on exit uh, 451. It's a rafting area. The, uh, it's the Pigeon River. It's the number one rafted uh, river in the uh, United States starts here in North Carolina and runs into Tennessee and there in Hartford it's where we have 11 rafting companies this uh, couple and their two daughters <clears throat> they were um, driving from Asheville headed over to Tennessee and the little girl had just got her driver's license y'all remember when we got her driver's license you know daddy can I drive can I drive and they're driving off I-40 and that's too dangerous and so they get off the exit 451 Daddy, can I drive? Can I drive? To, to his, and he goes, okay, this looks like a safe road. And so he gets out. Mom gets in the back seat. Dad gets in the front seat. Daughter gets in the, and starts driving. <clears throat> well, it's a narrow road. And as she's driving, she comes off the road, and her right tire comes off. Well, what's a kid do? Jerks it to the left, stomps on it, and launches into the Pigeon River. That is their car right there. Now, is that a time for the Swiftwater team to say, or guys, that aren't, we don't even have a Swiftwater team, the guys say, let's see, how do we do Swiftwater Rescue? Let's get out the manual. No, you got to know how and jump into it and act fast. Nobody perished. Or let's say we have a structure fire. Is that the time to say, I need to learn fire behavior? How do I use this nozzle? No, you've got that lieutenant who just ran around. He's done a 360. Is there any kids hanging out the back window upstairs? Is anybody out there asking for help? Is there a propane tank in the back? And he comes around. He's done his 360, and now we're ready for attack. Why? Because we have prepared. Preparing is so important. And, y'all, there is a battle now. Do you believe there's a battle now? Yes. Absolutely. But do you believe there's a battle to come? Yes. yes. What does Daniel 12:1 say? It's going to be a battle 
worse than anything has ever happened. When Michael stands up, it's going to be worse than ever. You know, I, you know, we see terrible, awful things. I definitely see terrible, awful things in, in the fire service. But my eyes were plumb opened when I went to Rwanda. I go over and teach in Rwanda, and we, do, we have a program that we teach over there, and it's doing quite well now. And they've just jumped on it like a tick on a dog, and it's working well. And, and I, I learned about, I, I remember, I was actually, I was here. I was literally, I was here when, the, uh, when we were dealing with the, um, the Rwanda situation. And, um, or maybe it was the year before I came here, somewhere right in there. It was in 92, so it had to be the year before I moved here. And um, do you remember the, um, the genocide? Do you remember that? Over a million people were killed in how often? How long? A hundred days. Over a million people. The Hutus killed the Tutsis. And, and you could in church, in an Adventist church, have Hutus and Tutsis in the same church. And uh, there's a guy here from Kenya. Where's he? Yes, you remember that, don't you? Were you living in Kenya? And so the, it came time that the Hutus decided to kill the Tutsis. And as I went through the Genocide Museum... As I listened to stories, the conference president, his wife and eight children were slaughtered by machete. Danny, could he, how would you handle that? Are you ready for that? And they told us stories, and I will not tell y'all what happened to the children because there's children here. And what happened to the wives. I won't tell you what happened to the wives in front of the husbands. It was, it was satanic. And I'm sure you heard about that over in Kenya. What happened? A time as never before. It's going to be worse than that. Are you ready for that? It's going to be worse than, than the Reformation. How many of y'all have read Great Controversy? And you've read the stories of the, of the Waldensians? And the wife sitting there as the husband's burned to the stake? Are y'all ready for that? And so this morning I'd look at how do we prepare the brain for battle. Both for now and to come. Preparing is so important. Number one is the fuel that you put in the brain. Now, looking at fuel, anybody know how much that car runs? Anybody have a guess? How much? 50? 250,000? Oh, 450,000? <clears> Try $8.5 million. Now, do you think that they're going to put kerosene in that car? You think they're going to put diesel in that car? They're very cautious on what they put in that car. How about this car? It's a Bugatti, special Bugatti, $18.9 million. Now, that's just plum crazy. Um, and then there's this car. Now, that car, the driver was not happy with it. He bought it in Newport. And then it had 800 and some horsepower. His first gas tank, the computer said he got 2 point some miles to the gallon. And uh, you will be the only church that's got this answer right. Um, and he sent it, he decided he wanted more power. This man is 70 some years old. And he sent it to this fella in Level Cross, North Carolina. Who'd he send it to? I told you, you're the only church that got that one right. He went and sent it to Mr. Petty and his crew. Mr. Petty cranked it up between the engine and the nose to 1,500 horsepower, 1,500 horsepower. That's more than the Bugatti. Mr. Petty told this man, he says, you can no longer buy your fuel at the gas station. You have to buy your fuel probably from the airport. It has to be 115 octane. And this man told me that Mr. Petty told him you no longer get miles per gallon, you now get miles per tank and uh, they, Mr. Petty took first gear out of it because it just squalled its tires in first gear and he says don't park it when you park it do not park it with your tires turned because it just do a victory spin and so when he parked it he had to have his tires always just straight it's a powerful car his boys will not even ride in that car it is so powerful but the fuel is very important of what you put in that car would you agree well I was trying to figure out 
how to get a manual. And so I found a manual in this S. Cabriolet. And let me read to you what Mercedes says. They say, note, damage caused by wrong fuel. Even small amounts of the wrong fuel could result in damage to a fuel system, the engine, and the emission control system. Never refuel using diesel. Now, you'd think it's just horse sense, right? But there are people who make the mistake and put the wrong fuel in. And I won't go into those stories. But anyway, gasoline more than 10% ethanol, gasoline more than 30% methanol, gasoline with uh, additives containing metal. So they're very specific, specific on what fuel needs to go in that vehicle. Do we need to be specific on what fuel goes into us? Yes. This is interesting. If you accidentally refuel with the wrong fuel, do not switch the engine on. I remember one time at Collegedale, we had a fire one night late at night, and it's so nice I can talk and y'all understand me. Sabbath school really affirmed that. Listen to the teacher and the rest of y'all. Y'all talk like I do. I was in Atlanta a couple weeks ago, and there were people from the Caribbean. They had no idea what I was saying. And they were in Atlanta, but it was a Caribbean church. And, and so what happened was one night, it was late, it was, uh, it was actually early in the morning, we had a fire and, the, and the, uh, the driver of the fire truck comes up and we had two fuel tanks, one diesel, one gas because some of our trucks were diesel, some of them were gas and he put the wrong fuel in the truck. Fortunately, he caught it before he cranked it and we had to leave the truck and our mechanic Jimmy had to come over and drain the fuel. And so it says here, if you accidentally refuel with wrong fuel, do not switch the engine on. Now, this is interesting. Look at this. Even small amounts of the wrong fuel could result in damage to the fuel system and the engine. The repair cost, does it say could be? It says are high. Is there any time that we stick something in our mouth and we go, that shouldn't be there? Could could it damage our system? Could the cost, repair cost be high? Yes. The brain is the organ and instrument of the mind and controls the whole body. In order for the other parts of the system to be healthy, the brain must be healthy. In order for the brain to be healthy, the blood must be pure. If by correct habits of eating and drinking, the blood is kept pure, the brain will be properly nursed. And so I, many times I wondered in healthcare, which is first? You know, what happens in the brain, what happens in the body? It's very clear here. God has pointed it out to us. Before you treat the body, you must treat the brain. And the way you treat the brain is... By taking care of the blood. And the way you take care of the blood is by what? What you stick in your mouth. Eating and drinking. And yes, it's true. The other laws of health are very, very important. But it's very important of what we stick in our mouth. And as we look here at what um, we read this morning. See, God, God could have said, whether therefore ye eat Oh, I'm sorry, whether therefore you do, do all to the glory of God. And that would have been all-inclusive, would you agree? And that would have been fine. But God loves us. Does he love us? Amen. Does God love us? Amen. Yes, he does. And so he said, listen, it's, do everything. But, it's, you know, it's really important, y'all, what you stick in your mouth, what you're eating, and what you're drinking. Because that can be very, very important. Now I'm reading from Harvard. Now let's see what the science folks say. Think about it. Your brain is always on. It takes care of your thoughts and movements, your breathing, your heartbeat, your senses. It works hard 24-7, even while you're asleep. This means your brain requires a constant supply of fuel. That fuel comes from the food you eat. And what's in that fuel makes all the difference, put simply. What you eat directly affects the structure and function of your brain and ultimately your mood. Now, what are we talking about today? Preparing the brain for battle. So we're, that's why we're talking about the brain. And we're talking about the food that goes into our bodies to make good, healthy blood, to be fueled to the brain, can make a difference of how well that organ works. What is the most important organ in the body? The heart. What else? The brain. Why the brain? It controls everything. Even more important than that. It 
It's how you talk with God. That is our communication tool. Ability to talk with God is the function of the brain. And yes, if you're hurting throughout your body, it does make a difference in how you can discern. But the brain function is imperative in our discernment, in our prayer, in hearing the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit goes, no, Walt, don't do that. Or, Walt, you better do that. And so the fuel that we put in our mouth that provides the blood with the proper nutrients determines how well that brain functions. Just like those cars. If you put kerosene in that car that Mr. Petty built, rebuilt down there. Do you know that car had 300 miles on it when Mr. Petty totally ripped it apart and rebuilt it? Amazing. But you've got to put the right fuel in it, Mr. Petty said. Like an expensive car, continuing with Harvard, your brain functions best when it gets only premium fuel, eating high-quality foods that contain lots of vitamins and minerals and antioxidants nourishes the brain and protects it from oxidative stress. The waste, free radicals produced when the body uses oxygen, which can damage cells. So the fuel that we put in our body, it's got to, you've got to have fats, proteins, carbohydrates, and then you have a catalyst that, which is vitamins that kicks on fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. But then you got another catalyst that's minerals that kicks on the vitamins, which then kicks on the fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. So important. And so much of our food does not have those because of hybridization. Did you know it's that time of year? Anybody put in? I know y'all do garden in here. How many of y'all doing garden? Let me ask a question real quick. I ask this in every church that I go to, and I think y'all are going to beat them. How many of y'all were born in this county? How many of y'all? How many of y'all from uh, central North Carolina originally? Okay. How many of y'all from North Carolina? Raise your hands high. Yeah. How many of y'all from the south? Yes. I knew y'all would. Okay. It's amazing. Isn't it so cool to come back 30 years later and see folks still running in the church? It's so good. I appreciate y'all. Um, so, North Carolina, University Department, uh, University of North Carolina, Department of Agriculture, found that hi hybrid seeds uptake only approximately 40% of the nutrients out of the soil that an heirloom seed would pull out. Let me say that again. A hybrid seed pulls out of the soil approximately only 40% of the nutrients that an heirloom seed will pull out and put in that tomato or whatever else you're growing. That's huge. And this is another cool thing. And I learned this just last year. I've gone back to school again. And um, when you have an, an a, a heirloom piece of food, it doesn't have a good shelf life. And the reason it doesn't have a good shelf life is there's chemicals in it that start breaking it down. And so what they did is they went and hybridized the, the, uh, the, the food so that they, they got rid of some of these chemicals that's in there that causes it to rot faster. And you know what them chemicals are? Amylase, protease, and lipase. Now, that's very important from the first third of digestion. And, and God put it in our food, enzymes, digestive enzymes, to help because the other parts in our saliva, as I talk to the kids in the school, I teach them about spit. And you got to chew and mix the spit with the food so that the, so it soaks up the, the saliva into the food so that the enzymes are there to break it down. Well, God put enzymes in our food. But we have, in order to have a longer shelf life, hybridized out those enzymes. And now we don't have adequate enzymes. And so research shows us the organs in the body are actually having to overwork or you're even lack of enzymes. Therefore, you're not breaking the micro, I'm sorry, the macro into micro in, uh, nutrients so they'll be soaked up in the villi. Unfortunately, just like an expensive car, your brain uh, can be damaged if you ingest anything other than premium fuel, continuing from Harvard. If substances from low premium fuel, such as what you get from processed or refined foods, gets to the brain, it has little ability to get rid of them. That's really interesting, isn't it? So you got a Twinkie and you eat a Twinkie. The brain has a hard time getting rid of the Twinkie or other processed foods. Diets high in refined sugars, for example, are harmful to the brain. 
In addition to worsening your body's regulation of insulin, they also promote inflammation and oxidative stress. Multiple studies have found a correlation between a diet high in refined sugars and impaired brain function, and even a worsening of symptoms of mood disorders such as depression. WHO, World Health Organization, says that we're about to surpass the number one diagnosis in America. The number one diagnosis in America today is stress. And what's about to surpass stress is depression. Also this morning, I was walk, working on a call. Um, got a, uh, I got a call from our chaplain. And uh, he said, uh, out on Facebook, one of our firefighters was having some challenges last night. I, got, I talked to our emergency, med uh, emergency medical director for the county. He said, Walt, one of your guys is having problems, depression, talking some bad stuff. <coughs> you need to check on it. Depression, it's a huge issue out there. He was talking about ending life last night. That's, that's big stuff. You take that serious. It makes sense. If your brain is deprived of a good, quality, uh, a good quality nutrition or if free radicals or damaging inflammatory cells are circulating within the brain's enclosed space, further contributing to brain tissue injury, consequences are to be what? Expected. Expected. It's expected if you put diesel in your gas burner car, there is going to be problems. Yes? It's expected if you put gasoline in your diesel burning tractor, there's going to be problems. It's just expected. That's physiology. And the same thing is true with our body, according to Harvard. What's interesting is that for many years, the medical field did not fully acknowledge the connection between mood and food. That was interesting to hear Harvard say. Today, fortunately, the field of nutritional psychiatry is finding there are many consequences and correlations between not only what you eat, how you feel, and how you ultimately behave, but also the kinds of bacteria in your gut. And we could talk all weekend on gut biome. MIT is doing some amazing research on gut biome. We have to protect what's going on in our gut. And I'm trying to remember this after, if I'll talk about it this afternoon. The 75%, 75% of your immune system is dependent on what's going on in your gut. Anybody ever ridden one of these? What if, instead of putting coal, he put toilet paper? Is it going to make it up the mountain? No, you've got to have the right BTUs. Fuel. Best fuel for the brain, avocados, number one. Beets are good fuel. Blueberries, broccoli, celery, green leafy vegetables, rosemary, turmeric, potatoes, asparagus, walnuts. I talked to a boy yesterday. He's wanting more energy. So I was encouraging him to do some more things with energy and, and it ha did not deal with meat. He says, no, I got to have meat. He says, I don't eat vegetables and fruit. I eat meat. I said, buddy, I said, what do, uh, what do elephants eat? They're strong. Or how about Clydesdales? Or, uh, you know, giraffes? Or gorillas? I miss going over to the zoo and, and seeing the gorillas over there. Y'all have a tremendous zoo. Best zoo I've ever been to. Um, the big animals, they don't have to eat meat. The second key, WHO and, and, uh, and the uh, CDC says, uh, is um, the importance of, of exercise. Psychology Today, it's a journal for psychologists. It says, neuroscientists around the globe agree that physical activity is the best medicine to maintain brain health throughout one's lifespan. The best medicine, the best medication for your brain, according to these neuroscientists around the world, is exercise. There's a guy at Duke, Dr. Walter Kempner. He was a genius, a very smart man. German, uh, not only was a physician, he was also, I think it was a PhD in biochemistry. And as you look at when we grew up in school, 
We had morning exercise, recess. We had recess after dinner. Now I'm a country boy, dinner's at noon. We had recess after dinner. We had recess in the afternoon. And then we played when we got home. And this physician at Duke found that adults need the same thing. We need to exercise four times a day for optimum health. It's very, very important. Exercise improves the structure, function, and, the, and connectivity of your brain. Psychology Day also reports there are many reasons that exercise is good for your brain. These include increases blood flow, which improves cerebrovascular health. The release of neurotropic factors like uh, BDNF, which stimulates the growth of new neurons. And the benefits of glucose and lipid metabolism, which bring nourishment to the brain. People who regularly perform aerobic exercise, walk, running, jogging, brisk walking, swimming, cycling, have greater scores on uh, neuropsychological function and performance tests that measure certain cognitive functions, such as attentional control, inhibitory control, cognitive flexibility, working memory, declarative memory, spatial memory, and information processing speed. How good your information processing speed? Anybody ever ask you a question, you go, or even where the keys are? The transient effects of exercise on cognition include improvement in most executive functions, attentional, attention, I think some folks need more exercise there, attention, working memory, cognitive flexibility, inhibitory control, problem solving, and decision making. Y'all, we're preparing the brain for battle. A time as never before. Do we need these functions in our brain to work well? Are we presented with temptations that we need these items working? Yes? Quickly. Not to think about it tomorrow and go, I wish I didn't do that. Have you ever done that? That was stupid. You ever done that? Well, we, it needs to be fast. You know, I remember when, when Lotus came out. Y'all remember Lotus? And I remember going to, over to Durham and learning how to use spreadsheets with, with Lotus. And you'd hit F7 on these big budgets. And it would take about, oh, a minute to crunch them numbers. A minute. And we're sitting there, and this boy from Raleigh, he's sitting beside me. And uh, his number in about three to five seconds is crunched. And we did it again, and we'd hit F7 to do the calculation, which is a whole lot faster than rewriting budgets, I can tell you that. But it was fast, and I said, what did you do to your machine? And he says, oh, nothing. I said, no, you did something to your machine. What did you do? He said, well, I increased my, 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 uh, my uh, processor from, uh, from uh, whatever chip it was, from 2 meg to 4 meg rams, his memory. Now, I mean, today, we, that's nothing. <laughs> But we need to be, today when you hit it in there, boom, you got an answer, right? When you hit enter, boom. And that's how we need to be when Satan comes and dangles something in front of you. You don't need it to be a while. It, no, that's wrong. I ain't doing that. Or yes, God, I'll do that right now. Exercise makes that processing speed increase so that we can make those discernment decisions. And information processing speed for a period of up to two hours after exercising. Students, how many of y'all are in school? If you want to make better grades on your tests, exercise within two hours before a test, and you'll, your processing will be better. You'll do better on your scores. Water. Adequate hydration. Our brains depend on proper hydration to function optimally. Brain cells require a delicate balance between water and various elements to operate. And when you lose too much water, that balance is disrupted. Your brain cells lose efficiency. Years of research have found that when we're parched, we have more difficulty keeping our attention focused. We need a lot of people drinking water. Dehydration can impair short-term memory function and the recall of long-term memory. Both short-term and long-term 
The ability to perform mental arithmetic, like calculating whether or not you'll be late for work if you hit the snooze button for another 15 minutes, is compromised when your fluids are low. And the question is, how much water do you drink? According to the University of California at Davis, it takes a half a gallon, three water, four water bottles, two liters to run a five-year-old. A half a gallon, 64 ounces, two quarts, two liters, four water bottles, all equal 64 ounces, basically. That's how much it takes to run a five-year-old. Is anybody in here five years old? Who's five? Okay, can you stand up a minute so we can see you? Most of us are a little bit bigger than when we were five years old. For that little youngin, according to the University of California at Davis, it takes a half a gallon to run his brain and the rest of his body. Well, they find from his size up to 128 pounds is, is actually the same amount of water to sit on the couch. But if you're out exercising, sweating, you need even more. You could need another quart to two quarts. Now, the state of Tennessee tells me I'm to drink a gallon of water a day in the event that I might have to fight a house fire today. And then once I, in rehab, I got to drink more water. <clears throat> Over 128 pounds is body weight divided by two. That's pretty standard out there across the America, uh, America today in healthcare is body weight divided by two. Unless you're just super big. I had a lady call me the other day. She was 400 and some pounds. And so there's an extra special figure for her. Uh, you, there's another calculation for her. She didn't need 200 and some ounces of water a day. But let's say you weigh 200 pounds. How much water do you need to drink? 100 ounces to sit on the couch. But if you're out exercising, working in the garden, talking, let's say you're a school teacher, you need even more because you're getting, letting fluids go as you're talking. It's, it's going out your, 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 uh, your breath. And so... That's only one part of the equation. Two years ago, or a year ago, I was in a class and for school, and um, the professor had us to, the first week, we, it, was a, uh, it was a class that we looked at labs, a lot of different labs. And so <clears throat> one of the items that we had to monitor was hydration. And he had all of us in class measure our hydration for a week. Most everybody was dehydrated that whole week. The next week, he had us use the formula. If you're uh, 128 pounds or less or 128 pounds or more, the formula I just gave you, we followed that for one week. Most everybody was dehydrated. Oh, what's going on here? Well, what he did is he introduced us to, well, we learned this back in physiology in school, but he gave us some history behind it. We learned something about free flow. Did y'all in school and healthcare learn about free flow? Well, they taught us about free flow and, and A&P years ago, but... What happens is, is this physicist who was buddies with Einstein, who was another neuros, uh, uh, what was he? It was a uh, physicist, real brainy guy. He found out that when you drink more than three to four ounces of water at a given time, it goes into free flow. You just urinate it off. So have you ever drank a, a glass of water or drank a water bottle and not long later you had to go run the restroom? Because you had free flow. And what he found was, if you will do this, that much water, three to four times every half hour, based on your size, if you're small, three, if you're larger, four, every half hour, except, this was interesting, he said 15 minutes before you eat, why you eat, an hour after you eat. My buddy of Einstein knew that. We, have we ever heard that, not to drink with meals? Interesting, huh? So that next week, we all did that. The next week, every one of us, every single day that we tested, and we tested our, our, our multiple labs every day to learn how to do it. And, and so we, everybody in the course were hydrated that next week because we took the body weight divided by two. We then did this three or four times, making sure it was just throughout the day. And, it's, you know, I'm an old farm boy. I grew up on a farm. It's just horse sense. You take a five-gallon bucket and you pour it on a, on a mater plant, what's going to happen? It's going to run off. But if you have a drip line, you're going to have better saturation. And the same thing is true with our body. 
And the effects of hydration on the brain function depends upon the severity of dehydration. Mild dehydration may adversely affect mood, energy level, and ability to concentrate. Now, what is God's mission? To save humanity. What is Jesus' mission? To save humanity. What is our mission? To point the sin-sick soul to Christ. Yes? And are we all sin-sick souls? Yes. And so, if you are a person who has mood issues, do you think somebody wants to have what you're trying to t give them? Danny warned me I might better take this thing on here. So if you're trying to tell a person that you need to be a Christian and you're mean as a striped snake, do you think they want to be part of you, what you're belonging to? No. Dehydration can affect your mood. Ability to concentrate. Do we need to concentrate? Yes, we do. Severe or prolonged dehydration, according to Mayo Clinic, dehydration may cause serious cognitive impairment, delirium, permanent brain damage, or even death. Now, that's, that's major dehydration. But it definitely can, uh, can uh, cause cognitive impairment significantly. <clears throat> Just a mere 2% drop in body water can trigger fuzzy short-term memory, trouble with basic math, and difficulty focusing on the computer screen or a printed page. And that's work issues. Batman, Batman Jotty. Who's ever read Dr. Batman Jotty? If you want to read and learn about hydration, Batman Jotty is a physician. He's probably the expert out there. Uh, he wrote a book called Your Body's Many Cries for Water. If you want to learn more about hydration and help your patients or your clients or your family, read that book, Your Body's Many Cries for Water. Amazing book. He says every function inside your body is regulated by and depends on water. Every function inside the body is regulated by and depends on water. I have people who come in to see me as I sit down and talk to them about their health issues, and I say, how much water do you drink? Well, I don't ever say, do you drink, you know, do you drink enough water? Because that enough is a, it's a huge disparity. How much water do you drink? And I have folks say, I don't do water. Well, what do you do? I do Mountain Dew. And I had this one fellow came in for diabetes. I said, how much Mountain Dew do you do? And he says, I do three liters a day. Three liters of Mountain Dew a day. And you can imagine some of the issues he's having there with why he has diabetes. And so as people come in, they'll say, well, can I count my coffee? I used to have folks come in and say, can I count my moonshine? And literally, they did. I, I think those guys have died off now. They don't say that anymore. Um, but we're now told for every cup of coffee, you need to drink three cups, uh, six cups of water to replace what that cup of coffee did to you. So every cup of water, or every pot of water, or two pots, I mean two pots of coffee, you need six times that amount in water to make up for what that coffee did to you. Water must be available to carry vital elements. Back in school, they taught us, they said that water is the train car that carries the nutrients as we eat at the food, as it goes into the blood. Water is what carries, it's the train car that carries the nutrients throughout the body. And this is what Batman Jotty's talking about here. Water must be available to carry vital elements, oxygen, hormones, and chemicals to all parts of the body. And this is interesting. Without sufficient water to wet all parts equally, some more remote or distal, parts of the body will not receive the vital elements that water supplies. Well, what are those vital elements? It's the nutrients that it's carrying. Sunshine. Vitamin D boosts cognitive acceleration. In a study led by scientists at the University of Manchester in England, they looked at vitamin D levels and cognitive performance in more than 3,100 men aged 40 to 79, <coughs> excuse me, in eight um, different countries across Europe. <coughs> the data showed that those people with lower vitamin D levels exhibited slower cognitive processing speed. I had a lady send me her labs yesterday. She's down in West Palm Beach, Florida. Her vitamin D was in the 20s. <clears throat> Labs tell us today, <clears throat> used to, when I, went to, when I went here to church, we would say, oh, 32, that's good. No, it's not. Labs will tell you 30 to 60, I mean, to 99, uh, but, but that's not accurate. 
Dr. Arvo Khanna, a neurologist who specializes in brain function. He tells his patients he does not want their vitamin D below 60 for cognitive function. Dr. Ted Watkins, a good friend of mine, we used to work together. He's a surgeon outside of DC. Now he does lifestyle medicine. If you want good immune system, if you want good bone health ladies, he's, he says at least 80, better yet 90 to 100. Vitamin D is important. I had a lady come in one day. Well, I've got a good friend of mine, and some of y'all might know him. He's a physician. And he says, all you need is 5,000 IUs a day, and you're good. Nobody needs more than 5,000 IUs. I had a lady come in. Well, let me back up. So the last time I went to Africa, I took a friend of mine. He's a physician down in South Georgia. He's a black fella. And we went over there, and we were teaching physicians and nutritionists over there uh, that the government had asked us to train in lifestyle medicine. And he told these black physicians and black nutritionists in, in, in Rwanda, he says, we have sunglasses on our skin. It takes six times more sun exposure to get the same amount of vitamin D as it takes for Walt. Six times more. So this lady comes, takes that information. This lady comes in, she's Caucasian, she works in landscaping all year round, and her, she takes 5,000 IUs and her vitamin D level is 12. So I said, okay, let's jump it. Let's go 5,000 twice a day. So we're doing 2,000 a day. We'll do that for three months, re relabbed. And she's at 17, I believe it was, 17 or 18. I think it was 17. So I called my buddy up in D.C., Watkins, and uh, he does a lot of research with vitamin D. He says, well, let's do 20,000 BID. So 20,000 twice a day. So that's 40,000 a day. We went three months. It was 24. He goes, I don't know. He says, that's not good. And I said, well, we've got to research. Well, less than a week later, he calls me. He says, Walt, did you see the study just came out this morning on magnesium, the effect on vitamin D? I said, yes, I saw it this morning. He says, let's check that out. So we went to magnesium, to bowel tolerance, and did another three months, and she was at 97. She didn't have enough magnesium. Why are we deficient in magnesium? Why is 85% of, of, of America deficient in magnesium, we're told? Because the number one diagnosis is stress. When you're stressed, adrenaline goes up. When adrenaline goes up, God has a fire extinguishing, fire extinguishing system that goes off and it dumps magnesium to buffer the cells and protect it from the, magnes from the adrenaline, we're told. And so if you're stressed out, you could be low in what? Magnesium. So it's not how much vitamin D you take a day. It's what is in the blood. You've got to do a blood test for that. Vitamin D deficiency is a current epidemic in our society affecting 90% of the world's population. According to vitamin D expert Michael Hollick, we es estimate that the vitamin D deficiency is the most common medical condition in the world. It is clear that most people are not getting enough healthy sun exposure. Why? They're inside. They're working. Or they're sitting inside on their telephones or TV. We, you know, it was said in Sabbath school today that what? It was uh, you said 50% of the folks ain't working. Did God create us to work in an office or sit in the house? He created us to be outside. They didn't even have a house. They slept on the ground at night. We were created to be outside. <clears throat> Vitamin D deficiencies increase brain degenerative processes. A study published in the Archives of Internal Medicine show that those who are classified as deficient in vitamin D were 42%. Listen to this, y'all. Those that were uh, deficient in vitamin D were 42% more likely to have cognitive impairment. Meanwhile, those classified as severely deficient were 394% more likely to have cognitive impairment. This is the Archives of Internal Medicine. Do y'all know what your vitamin D level is? You need to. And the only way you're going to find out is not how much you take a day, but you need to get the lab work to find out. Because you want that brain working well. Why? We're in a time of battle, and we're about to go into a time as never before. And Danny and I were talking right before we came in, and Danny's going, it's going nuts. It's going nuts. It is going nuts. Would you agree? D deficiencies increase brain degenerative processes. The odds of cognitive impairment increase as vitamin D levels go down. 
says the study author, giving that both vitamin D deficiency and dementia are common throughout the world. This is a major public health concern. Serotonin brain function. See, what happens here is we go outside, and, and as the sun comes through the eye, it stimulates the pineal gland to convert the tryptophan that you had in your flaxseed this morning, which you ground and ate within 15 minutes. It converts the tryptophan into what? Well, melon, I mean, into cell, uh, serotonin. And so then, as the day goes on, is you, if you don't eat a big supper, if you go to bed on time, your pineal gland converts the serotonin into melatonin to help you sleep. You've got to have sunshine to make these happen. It is believed to help uh, regulate mood and social behavior, appetite and digestion, sleep, memory, and depression. Serotonin deficiency symptoms, poor memory, low mood, difficulty sleeping, low self-esteem, anxiety, aggression, making the right decisions, temperance. I used to think that temperance was, I don't drink, I don't do drugs, and, uh, and uh, I don't do alcohol. I'm temperate. You know, I'm, no, it's a lot more than that. It's a whole lot more than that. Alcohol, yes. Drugs, yes. Tobacco, yes. Do y'all still do stop, stop smoking programs here? Do y'all still do those? We used to do three to four a quarter. I mean, a, a year, once a quarter here. Hardest place I ever did tobacco cessation programs was right here in Kernersville. When I would go to stores to put up signs, they said, no, I don't want to offend somebody over at RGR, an employee. I couldn't, they wouldn't let me put it on the, on the radio station. They wouldn't let me put it on TV, uh, the newspaper. Uh, we just couldn't do it here. This is the hardest place I ever did it. It really was. But um, let me share you a quick story. So I was back there in the kitchen. That's where we were doing it. And this fella, he, <laughs> we did Tuesday night, Thursday night. And on Thursday night, I said, now everybody's going to quit. And we used to have quite a few folks come. We'd have 20, 30, 40 people. And the room was plumb full of people. And... Um, and I said, uh, everybody going to quit Sunday night because we're coming back Sunday night. And uh, everybody raised their hand except one fellow. And I said, is there a problem? Why can't you do it? He says, my mother-in-law's come to town this weekend. She'll leave Wednesday. He says, I'll quit Wednesday. <laughs> and that happened in your dining room in the back there. And uh, mother-in-law came to town. She left. Wednesday night he quit. And he, he was very successful, did well. <laughs> But it's more than that. How about music? Can the music you listen to affect your brain function? But it's my body. I can do whatever I want to with it. Isn't that what they tell you? It's not our body. God says in Corinthians 6 that his son bought it. It don't belong to us no more. We're just caretakers. TV, what about that? Can that affect our brain? Gaming? Have y'all done Scott Redsmith? Yes. Tremendous, isn't he? Yes. Tremendous. Social media, Scott talks about that. As we grow and develop very specific chemical reactions to uh, activate and deactivate parts of your genome at strategic times and in specific locations, Essentially, turning on our genes on and off. Epigenetics is a study of these processes and the factors that influence them. Do not let someone tell you you're genetically predisposed. Ain't nothing you can do. One, that's mostly mis that's mostly a misdiagnosis. Not 100 percent, but it could be you're just North Carolina predisposed. You know what I'm talking about. You eat the same food your daddy ate, and your daddy ate the same food his daddy ate, and y'all got the same diseases. If your granddaddy smokes and he gets lung cancer, and your daddy smokes and he gets lung cancer, and you smoke and you get lung cancer, I have had medical doctors argue with me till the cows come home. That was genetically predisposed. But I go into the school system, and a kindergartner say, Mr. That's because you smoke. It's not all genetics. But yes, there is some genetics, but here's hope. Through epigenetics, we're learning that through these laws that we're talking about this morning, you can even change your genes. And that is so cool. 
what they're finding in epigenetics. <sighs> um, it is a law of the mind that it gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is trained to dwell. I mention this to every place I go that I teach this. Do you know where I learned that? Anybody want to guess where I learned that? Come on, elders. Come on, board members. Uh, pardon? That's exactly right. Fred Rogers would say that back in the board meetings. He would read that before we started. Sure it was. It was right here. It is true. It is a law of the mind that it gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is trained to dwell. Y'all had a huge impact on my life. You really did while I was here. It is the law of the mind that it will narrow or expand to the dimensions of the things with which it becomes familiar. The mental powers will surely become contracted and will lose their ability to grasp the deep meanings of the world of, word of God unless they are put vigorously and persistently to task of searching for the truth. Do we search for the truth? Do we search? Or we just sit there and let it feed in? Whatever someone else searched. The mind will enlarge if it is employed by in tracing out the relation um, of subjects of the Bible. Um, comparing scripture with scripture and spiritual things with spiritual. Go below the surface. The richest treasures of thought are waiting for the skillful and diligent student. We've got to dig it. It's gems. And God has it there if we dig. We're almost finished. Adequate oxygen. That's a, can you imagine putting that thing on that Bugatti? His air filter? I don't think it'd work too good. Effects of air pollution on the brain. <clears throat> We're fortunate when I fly into L.A. If I go out there to speak. I mean, who's flown into L.A.? You fly in and you... It was so interesting to fly out there during COVID. You didn't have that smog. That was interesting. Uh, effects of pollution on the brain, children's psychological and motor development is negatively affected. Negatively impairs the brain white matter, uh, which affects nerve conduction speed, brain inflammation. Negatively affects executive functions such as planning and memory. Cognitive impairment. Increased behavioral problems. Crime rates increase. That's NIH. But it's not just pollution. Because you don't have a whole lot of pollution here. But are you breathing like a chihuahua? Or do you have good diaphragmic breathing? Who's taking voice? Did they teach you diaphragmic breathing? Who's taking a wind instrument? Did they teach you diaphragmic breathing? Yes, they did. We need to have diaphragmic breathing. Ellen White says that we need to have diaphragmic breathing. We live longer, she said. Fresh air has many health benefits, improves the brain's ability to function, gives clarity to the mind, improves concentration, boosts learning abilities, gives a sense of happiness and well-being by altering brain uh, levels of serotonin, and promotes quality sleep, kills bacteria and viruses, in the air. Rest. A sleepy person's brain works harder and accomplishes less. A single night of poor sleep is linked to less sufficient filtering, meaning one's brain has issues picking out important or relevant nuggets of information from all the uh, 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 insig insignificant junk one's senses absorb. Does, do we absorb uh, insignificant junk? Do we need to be able to filter those out? To have discernment? Satan's throwing stuff at you constantly. Sleep can affect that. Mayo Clinic finds the following on sleep and brain function. Getting at least seven hours of quality rest each night is essential for optimal health. Harvard is now saying at least seven and a half, but Harvard is flirting very, very hard. Very hard with eight hours. I expect Harvard to change pretty soon. Sleep uh, provides the foundation for all daily habits and decisions. Sleep deprivation can negatively affect mood and temperament, 
as well as one's ability to focus on daily tasks. Lack of sleep influences what and how uh, uh, much one eats. It's not just how many, there's three major things I look at for sleep. How many hours are you getting? Hours, hours. How many hours are you getting? Uh, I figured most of y'all understood that. Um, number two, what time are you going to sleep? We now know that from nine to ten, see, when we were in school, when Danny and I were in school, in A and P, we did not know that the brain had the lymphatic system. It was not until 13 that it was really started coming out, 14 when it was really becoming published. The brain has a lymphatic system. It's called the glymphatic system. And from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock, the brain does a deep clean. And from 10 o'clock to midnight, it does a thorough clean and flushing of the brain. And if you ain't asleep, you ain't flushing the toilet. It's not working. And you're missing it. So that's number two. And the other is, are you having contiguous sleep? Or men, are you waking up six, seven times to go to the bathroom? at night because of prostate issues. Ladies, are you waking up? And then when you wake up, you're worrying about the kids, the grandkids, or anything else you can worry about. And you go to sleep, wake up again, and start worrying again. We need that REM sleep. And people are not getting that today. It's very important. Sleep allows time for the mind and body to recover from the day's work. During the rapid eye movement, REM stage of sleep, the brain sorts the important information from the unimportant and files long-term memory. This is very important, y'all. If this stage of sleep cycle is shortchanged, mental focus and acuity can decrease. Sleep deprivation has a propensity to make one feel cranky, short-tempered. Um, there's just so much here. We're running out of time. This was interesting. Look at this one. And this is coming out of science. Sleep can help boost one's motivation and willpower, making it easier to fend off temptation. That's science telling us that. Is that important? Preparing the brain for battle? It is. And this one. It's the last one I'm going to look at. Can anybody tell me where that's located? What is the setting? A schoolhouse. <clears throat> and every Florida school and administrative building will be require, uh, uh, required to display in God we trust according to a bill presented, uh, passed by the Florida House on Wednesday. The bill states the phrase must be displayed in a conspicuous place. When Tennessee K through 12 public students begin classes next month, the nation's motto in God we trust will be required to be posted somewhere in their schools. I go into the school system in our county and I teach this issue. I, I call it the brain team. And I'm teaching these kids this information. And it's so important for the brains to function well. And if you, get the, if you teach them this, it's also going to affect childhood diabetes. It's also going to affect you know, other issues because other lifestyle issues uh, will, will take place. Used to, when I go in the school system, I'd have to say to the kids when I got to this one, i say, take out your money and look at what's your money. And what does every piece of money have on it? See, I couldn't say it. Wouldn't let me. And the kids would say, and God we trust. I said, yep, that what you just said. It's so important. Doctors in California found if we do that, what you just said, then you'll be healthier. When this was passed, it took the bridle off. And now I can talk to the kids about In God We Trust because it's in the, it's in the main office in the school I go to the most. I'll be there this coming Tuesday. Again, I go every month. And I go into other schools in the county. And it's, it's in a prominent location. And I can say, in God we trust. Is that important? See, when people come and see me and as they walk out, I'll say, don't forget the most important thing. And that's prayer. Trusting in God. You know, it's not lifestyle changes that heals them. It is God that heals them and blesses that. Now, we need to do that. It's a, common, it's a relationship of applying both between us and God. Arkansas schools to display in God we trust 
A new law in South Dakota now requires all public schools across the state to feature in God We Trust motto on display. You ought to see the churches I go to in other parts of this country. New York City, California, Washington State. When, they, when I talk about this, they cannot believe that that's required by the state. They just, they don't live in the Bible Belt. Though South Dakota is not in the Bible Belt. But that's an interesting state. Kentucky is the latest in the line of states requiring in God we trust motto in public schools. It's on our bills. It's on our coins. <clears throat> it's on our police cars in our town. We even have it on all the fire trucks. As we look at preparing the brain for battle, I want to leave you with this. We've got it on our money. We've got it in our school houses. We've got it on our police cars and we have it on our fire trucks. But I ask you, do you have it on your hearts? Please stand for our closing hymn.
fellowship dinner this afternoon. This afternoon, I hope you come back. We're going to be talking about the number one diagnosis in America. What is that? Stress. And then we're going to talk about Satan's ultimate weapon. Satan's ultimate weapon. Is that important? Come on back and we'll talk about that. Shall we pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, we're thankful and blessed by this church here at Kernersville. The strength that it has, that it's God-fearing people. I saw it 30 years ago and I see it again today. And Lord, we thank you for this. It's a beacon out there. And Lord, we ask that you will help to sharpen the saw. Prepare us for your son's soon coming. And as we apply these basic laws of health that you've given us. And yes, it's so easy for us to say, well, we've heard this our whole life. But no, Lord. that You have given us the key to a healthy brain, the key to a healthy body. Lord, give us the desire, the hankering to be healthy. And Lord, give us the willpower to do it. So not only just for ourselves, but for, as we, as we learned in Sabbath school this morning, the ability to have, how do you have kids that know finances? Because you teach them in the house when they're young. Lord, help us to teach our young'uns about health at home as they see us as, as family, as parents and grandparents applying it. And Lord, we ask that you bless this church as it applies these laws, prepare them, preparing them for the battle now, but most important, the battle soon to come. One as never before. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. week.